tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of three rounds of frightening fiction about risk-filled road trips nightmarish narratives, and villainous visitations. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring the frightening fiction of Drew Blood, Sam Hasem, and Heath Faff to life are voice talents Kristen Martin, Paul J. McSorley, and Drew Blood with Drew performing his own self-authored tale. All of tonight's performers are contestants in Chilling Tales for Dark Nights' fifth annual Evil Idol Horror Voice Acting Competition. If you enjoy their performances tonight, visit our YouTube channel and vote on theirs and the other entries in the competition. The first round is on now, and there's plenty more to come to send shivers down your spine all spooky season long. So check out our channel and join in the deliciously dark fun yet to come. Again, you can find Chilling Tales for Dark Nights in the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube on any search engine. Or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation to see a current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. We and the candidates appreciate your support. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Our first tale tonight was both written and performed by Evil Idol 2020 contestant number 12, Drew Blood. In it, we'll meet a gentleman whose love for his brother is undeniable, and who, as a result of his unconditional affections, finds himself with some very unusual decisions to make. Does love really conquer all? Stay tuned and find out. Without further ado, I present to you, Plastic Jesus. Stretching through one of the United States' largest deserts is Highway 50. Aptly nicknamed the loneliest road in America, it is indeed as secluded and desolate as one might imagine. On this particular night, the western horizon was lit up again and again in spectacular fashion. Distant thunderstorms illuminated the sky with countless bolts of lightning. On occasion, the low rumble of thunder could be detected even from that unbelievable distance, which gave any spectator a true measure of just how powerful those distant leviathans in the sky truly were. There was no moon to be seen on this night, but the stars were clear and bright, giving the surrounding desert on either side of the lonely highway an eerie glow. The constant stabs of lightning only served to add to the eeriness. In truth, however, it was a tranquil setting, peaceful 
with only the gentle desert breeze and chirping insects to break the near silence. In contrast to its brutally hot days, the nights here could become downright cold, and it wasn't an uncommon sight to find desert rattlers coiled up on the edges of the highway, taking full advantage of the heat that the asphalt absorbed while being scorched by the merciless sun. It was on a sudden and without warning that the tranquility of this peaceful stretch of deserted highway was shot all to hell when over the paved horizon roared a 1969 Oldsmobile 442, a beast of a car. With just one headlight, the massive metal beast came hauling ass, the driver's foot pressed firmly to the floor. The big block engine was wide open and the dual pipes were blasting a low rough baritone that gave the distant storm's rumble and thunder a run for its money. The old solid beast rocked to and fro with the slightest change in the road's terrain. The car's shot suspension became very evident when just after topping the horizon, there came suddenly an absolute explosion of bright orange sparks from under the beast as it bottomed out on the asphalt. Inside the car were two brothers, and they were not having a very pleasant night. The driver, Chris, was the older of the pair, and he was on the brink of sheer panic. His little brother, Doobie, was in the passenger seat, weakly holding an old red mechanics rag to the side of his neck. The idea was to staunch the loss of blood from the gaping mangled wound that had been put there only minutes earlier. In spite of his weakening effort, bright red blood pulsed down his shirt and was puddling in the leather seat around him. Son of a bitch! Chris bellowed. Hang on, little brother. Just hang on. We're gonna find you some help. In between groans of pain, Doobie rasped. <sighs> oh... Come on, mate. Who oh, you think you're trying to kid? <laughs> he coughed up blood and let it run down his chin. He was too weak to spit. Uh, we're in the middle of nowhere, big brother. And you damn well know that I'm dying. Chris cut him off. Don't even think about saying it, asshole. I promised Mama I'd look after your crazy ass. If you die on me, man, I swear I'll fucking kill you. These last words were spoken with an ironic laughter. Uh, well, who was the old bastard, do you think? Doobie asked. Don't know, Chris answered, while bracing for another bottom out on the road. Chris winced as he saw the bright sparks in his rearview mirror. The beast rumbled on. He continued. Some psychotic asshole cannibal, I reckon. I don't know, man. I don't know. But there was something wrong with him. There was something wrong with his eyes. I didn't see his eyes, but he damn sure took a big chunk out of my neck, bro. <laughs> Doobie's voice was weakening fast. Uh, hey, Chris. I ain't feeling too spry here, son. <laughs> Chris interrupted. Just lay back, Doob. Just keep holding pressure, okay? Don't let off. Save your energy, okay? I, I got this. I got this. Chris's eyes were stinging now and he smashed his fist into the steering wheel out of rage and desperation. Damn it! Chris and Doobie were brothers in crime as well as blood. And as pertains to brothers, strangely enough, they were pretty good friends. They had stuck together after their mama died two years earlier. Chris felt the need to keep an eye on his baby brother. Doobie had always been full of piss and vinegar, a real hell raiser. Chris, for his part, hadn't necessarily been an angel, but Doobie, <laughs> well, let's just say that when it comes to the Ten Commandments, Doobie gives exactly zero fucks. Come to think on it, as far back as Chris could remember, Doobie's give a damn tank had always been empty. Doobie cared only about his big brother and maybe about money. 
but that was probably more of a lust thing. In fact, it was Doobie's lust for dollars that had gotten them where they were now. Up Shits Creek without a paddle. Two days earlier, while sitting in his favorite pub, Chris had been finishing off a beer when his phone began buzzing on the bar top. He looked at his phone and sighed with a resigned smile on his face. Before answering, Chris mumbled to himself, Oh, Christ, here we go. He hit the talk button. Hey, Dube, said Chris. What you got going on, man? Dube responded with a little ball breaking. Let me guess, you're at, um, the pub? Oh, you know where I am, dickhead, Chris said bluntly. He wasn't in the mood for his brother's shit. He was never in the mood for his brother's shit, come to think on it. Of course, that only fueled Doobie's ball-breaking agenda. Well, <laughs> top of the morning to ye, fucker. <laughs> Chris thought to himself, Jesus, he's losing his damn mind. Then said aloud, What do you want, Doobie? Doobie, still enjoying himself, said, <laughs> I don't feel bad, big brother. I ain't been sober in days myself. Chris had finally had enough and said bluntly, Why did you call me, Doobie? <laughs> oh, yeah. Guess who got a hold of the GPS coordinates for you-know-who's cash of money and guns? <laughs> Just guess. Right to the point, Chris asked, How much we talking here, Doobie? Doobie replied very seriously now, We're talking full retirement here, big brother. <laughs> I ain't shitting you. Full retirement. Silence. Chris was stunned for a few seconds. See, Doobie was a lot of things, but one thing he was not was a liar. If Doobie said something was, then it was, and Chris knew it. His pulse quickened as he asked, All right, when? Two days, big brother. I gotta get a couple things in order first, and then we'll head out. It's buried outside Eureka Summers out there in the desert. <laughs> Eureka! Can you believe that? That's what they call poetical. <laughs> oh, on Highway 50? Uh, yes, sir. Jesus, Doobie, that's out in the middle of nowhere. Well, where in the hell would you bury such a cash, Chris, huh? Your backyard? <laughs> yeah, I can see you doing that. <laughs> no, 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 no. You'd probably put it in your mattress. <laughs> Doobie would have continued guffawing for another five minutes if Chris hadn't finally rolled his eyes and told him, I'll be ready, Doobie. Just pick me up on your way out of town. Yeah, about that, Chris. Uh, we're going to have to take your car. You see, my truck, well, my truck blowed up on me last week. I don't know. I didn't change the oil or the blanker fluid or something. I don't know. Hell, you know I don't know jack shit about vehicles. Chris just groaned. God damn it, Doobie. Two days later, and 30 miles outside the abandoned ghost town of Eureka, Chris and Doobie found themselves digging under the stars. Chuckling to himself, Doobie said to his brother, <laughs> Man, I can't believe that drunk fool actually handed me the key to his desk. <laughs> Wanted me to fetch his pint of turkey. <laughs> <laughs> told me it was in the bottom drawer he did. Doobie chuckled and continued. So while I was there, <laughs> I just reached on over and opened up that top drawer, you know, for a little look-see. I said you not, big brother. Right there on a little yellow piece of paper were the coordinates to his legendary cash. <laughs> Dipshit! Chris was laughing along with Doobie now. They were both in good spirits, a rare thing. The laughter stopped abruptly when Doobie's shovel struck metal. They looked at each other and began laughing. Then they began to howl and laugh and celebrate together right there in the hole. The brothers were still laughing and celebrating and too excited to see or hear what was approaching them until it was right up behind Doobie. The brothers had both stood in the massive hole so they could stretch their backs. In doing so, 
Their heads and shoulders were all that shone above the surface of the ground. That's when Chris saw it. At ground level, and right behind Doobie's shoulder, was the pale, gaunt, and grime-covered face of an extremely old man. He had crawled right up to Doobie in a nightmarish manner, moving faster than he had any right to move. It was horrifying to see, and it sent a thrill of terror through Chris's entire being. He wanted so bad to warn Doobie, but could only manage to bring his hand up in fitful jerks to point. Doobie, seeing his brother, said as he turned to look, The fuck you? The old man pounced. Before Doobie knew what was happening, it had sank its rotted, jagged teeth into the side of his neck, tearing away a mouthful of flesh. Doobie screamed in exquisite agony as the old creature chewed and swallowed with relish, its limbs shaken in extreme ecstasy. Doobie's scream pulled Chris out of his shock. With no more hesitation, he pulled his forty-five from the waist of his jeans and put two rounds in the thing's chest just as it leapt into the hole with them. It collapsed into the bottom, unmoving. Chris kept the pistol trained on the Ancient One for a heartbeat longer and then realized he needed to see to his little brother. Doobie had also collapsed to the bottom and was sitting on the metal box with his back against the dirt wall, holding his mangled neck. Then Chris saw it. Blood. Lots of blood, soaking Doobie's shirt and jeans. Oh, Jesus, Doob. Come on, come on. I'll get you to the car, little brother. <laughs> no longer caring about anything but his baby brother, Chris managed to get Doobie out of the hole and into the car. The cash lay untouched. The only thing down there now was the lifeless thing. After he put Doobie into the car, Chris looked back at the excavation. In that moment, a pale, bony hand and forearm suddenly reached above the edge of the hole. What the hell? Chris didn't waste any time now. He sprinted to the driver's side and jumped in the seat, slamming the door. By the time he cranked the engine and put it in drive, the old man was at his door, reaching for Chris's face through the open window. Oh, shit! Chris screamed and slammed his foot on the gas. The beast roared out onto the road, throwing rocks and dust into a giant rooster tail. Chris looked back to see the old man gnashing its teeth and howling with rage. Good riddance. That had been only ten minutes ago. Chris now sped down the vacant highway at top speed, knowing not what to do nor where to go. Doobie interrupted his sporadic thoughts. <sighs> Hey, Chris. <laughs> His voice was very weak. Do you recall that little song? Mama used to sing for us. Chris thought Doobie's tone sounded like resignation, and he rebelled against it, saying, Don't talk like that, Doobie. I don't remember anything about no damn song. You're going to be fine, dude. You're going to be just fine. Damn, boy. She'd sing it to us when we were... when we were... little kid. Doobie's voice faded to silence, and his hand dropped limply to his leg. Chris whipped his head over to look at his brother. Doob, Chris said, reaching over to shake Doobie by his shoulder. Doobie's head only lolled to the movement. Chris hit the brakes and whipped the car over to the side of the highway. Doobie, he called again. Absolute despair clutched his soul and held fast. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No! Chris wailed. Then he began to plead. Dude, I, I remember the song, Doobie. 
I do. What about the song, dude? Talk to me. Just talk to me, little brother. What about the song? The man was inconsolable. Chris reached over and pulled Doobie to him, placing his little brother's head on his shoulder. Tears rolled freely down his dirt-caked face now. I'm sorry, little brother. I'm so damn sorry. It was then that Doobie, in one fluid motion, lifted up his head and with the snarl sank his teeth deep into Chris's neck ripping out a mouthful of flesh. Chris screamed. He screamed so hard his voice cracked and went falsetto. In the heartbeat it took Chris to reach down and grab his pistol. The thing that used to be Doobie had swallowed and was lunging at Chris's throat. In half a heartbeat before he pulled the trigger, Chris had seen his little brother's eyes, just like the old man's eyes lifeless, not his baby brother. The pistol cracked, sending a lead bullet into Doobie's forehead. Chris drove on down the lonely highway in silence. He felt numb. He knew he was losing too much blood. He knew he was losing consciousness. He knew he was dying. Doobie's corpse sat in the passenger seat with its head blown wide open, its mouth agape with the snarl still frozen on it, the lifeless corpse rocking to and fro with every bump and swerve on the highway. The car's engine droned on, and then Chris started half singing and half rasping out the words to a long-forgotten song. <sighs> I don't care if it rains or freezes <laughs> Long as I've got my plastic Jesus Sitting on the dashboard of my car <coughs> A single tear rolled down Chris's cheek as the road noise seemingly kept time for him. Comes in colors, pink and pleasant. <coughs> Glows in the dark, cause it's iridescent. <coughs> Take it with you, when you travel far. Tears rolled freely down Chris's face now. Words to a long-forgotten song coming to him out of the darkness. He could recall now how their mama would sing it to him whenever a bad storm would blow in at night. It always calmed the two little boys. He sang on. Get yourself... A sweet Madonna Dressed in rhinestones Sitting on a Pedestal Of abalone shell <laughs> His vision was going now And yet he kept the car on the road Though he was swerving a good bit he had to finish the song. It seemed all important to him. Going 90, I ain't scary. Cause I got the Virgin Mary assuring me. That I won't go to hell. <laughs> Down that dark, lonesome highway, the old car rumbled on. It was swerving much more now, yet travel on it did. 
into the distance of that quiet desert. And just after, the old beast topped that far-paved horizon. The old dim tail lights blinked out. And now, a word from our sponsor, Best Fiends. Well, friends, we've made it to our favorite month. October! Of course, costumes and beasts and ghouls and candy and... Yeah, okay, well, the, here's even better. My favorite game continues to be Best Fiends. I have played Best Fiends longer than any other game I've downloaded. It's a great puzzle game. It is a perfect distraction. And it's free to download. Just in love with this. It's a great puzzle game. I've gone from level 500-something about a month and a half ago. I think I've tracked it. It's, it's been about 45 days. I've gone from level 500 to level 1137. Thank you very much. Yes, we're moving right along because Best Fiends is just boredom's worst nightmare. Oh my gosh, my favorite thing about this is every single day you pick the game up and log in, you have these challenges that are presented to you. You grow your fiends. Growing fiends has become my favorite type of gardening this fall, I'm just saying. And I've never been a conformist in my life, but I'm proud to be among the 100 million downloads of Best Fiends. And as I've said, you don't have to play a certain amount of time every day to enjoy this game or meet certain challenges. No, very casual. Pick it up, play it as you see fit. It's always going to be there. Those little fiends are going to be nice and smiting for you. So look, go ahead and knock that boredom out of your own life and find a little happiness with a good challenge. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Hey, thanks for spending some time visiting our sponsors. We and they appreciate your support. I hope you enjoyed Plastic Jesus, as written and performed by Evil Idol 2020 contestant number 12, Drew Blood. Up next, we've got another sinister story for you. Written by author Sam Hasem and performed by Evil Idol 2020 contestant number 20, Kristen Martin. In it, a young woman trying to enjoy a simple bedtime story gets far more than your ordinary cautionary tale. When her grandmother tells her a tale of wrongdoing and revenge. Without further ado, I present to you the witch. Why would you tell a five-year-old kid such a fucked-up tale? Ever since the memory of my fifth birthday came back to me, this is the question I've kept asking myself. But I don't have the answer. I suppose I shouldn't be that surprised, given the other stories my grandma told me when I was little. The one about Mr. Longfingers, for instance, and the secret of the special knock. I really shouldn't be surprised at all. What follows is a memory from the day I turned five, because it's taken weeks of therapy for me to unlock it. Grandma, will you tell me a story before bed? She was halfway to the bedroom door when my words stopped her. I didn't want her to go. Grandma had just tucked me in and turned off my bedside lamp, and I suddenly felt afraid. Partly, it was the darkness of my bedroom. The shadows were so thick, I could barely make out my stuffed toys sitting in a row on top of my dresser. But mainly, it was my new birthday present. The present Grandma had got me. It wasn't my main present. That was the pack of monsters in my pocket toys I'd ripped open downstairs. This was an extra present. A secret present. I hated it. Even in the dark, I could see its shadowy outline on my table. It gave me the creeps. A story? Well, what kind of story would you like to hear? <sighs> it was a silly question because Grandma only ever told me one type of story. The scary kind. But because I was already a bit freaked out, I said something I wouldn't normally have done. Nothing too scary, Grandma. Grandma raised her eyebrows at me. Not too scary? I shook my head, 
She leaned over and switched my bedside light back on, then perched at the foot of my bed, smiled down at me. Out of the corner of my eye, I could still see Grandma's present. It was watching me from my bedside table. I did my best to ignore it. Okay, said Grandma, making herself comfortable. I think I'll tell you a story about a witch. Once upon a time, Grandma began, there was a young woman who lived in a cottage by the sea. She didn't have a care in the world. She went to school and she painted and she read adventure books by the fire in the evening. This girl lived with her mother and her grandmother, and they were all very close. She loved her family very much. One day in the early summer, the girl was coming home from school when she met a boy on the path. She'd never spoken to him before, but she recognized him well enough. He wore the same uniform she did, after all, and she guessed he must be in the year above her at school. Where are you off to? said the boy. His shirt was untucked, and he was smoking a cigarette. The girl hesitated. Her mother had told her cigarettes were bad. She'd also told her never to speak to strangers on her way home from school. But then again, thought the girl, was this boy actually a stranger? The headmaster at their school said they were all one big family. If this boy wore the same uniform as her, they couldn't really be strangers, could they? I'm going home, answered the girl. My house is along this path. The boy finished his cigarette, then flicked it into the grass. He smiled at the girl. Now before you go home, don't you want to see something cool? He asked. The girl was curious, but she also knew she couldn't be late. Her mother would worry terribly if she was late. So she thanked the boy and told him she had to be on her way. But just as she walked past him, he called out to her again. It's a puppy, said the boy. Our dog had a litter of puppies last week, and Dad said I could keep one. It's in this old barn near my house. Don't you want to see the puppy? Now the girl loved puppies. She'd wanted a dog for as long as she could remember, but her mother always said they couldn't afford one. Right then, she'd have given anything in the world to pet a cute little puppy. When she closed her eyes, she could just picture it. A happy little dog with a big pink tongue and a wagging tail, eager to meet her. The girl paused and looked down the path that led back to her house. She thought about her mother. Then she looked back at the boy who was smiling at her. Was there really any harm, thought the girl, in taking a quick look? So the girl followed the boy and he led her over a stile and across a big, big field. And they kept going and going until the girl saw a large barn towering in the distance. And she was so excited that she walked as fast as she could, and the boy laughed and walked right along with her. The girl only started to feel nervous when they were right outside the barn. It had taken longer to get there than she thought it would, and the sun was a lot lower in the sky now. She was going to be late getting home. Her mother would be worried. She wanted to see the puppy quickly so she could hurry back. But the barn was... dark and full of shadows and she couldn't see any sign of it inside. It's just over there at the back, whispered the boy, as he took her hand and led her into the shadows. He's going to be so excited to see you. So the girl took his hand and followed him. And even though his palm was sweaty, she held on to it tight, because she was suddenly starting to feel afraid. It was only when she heard footsteps and laughter behind her, and turned to see two bigger boys emerging from the barn shadows, that the fear inside her turned to terror. When the girl finally got back home, the sun was setting over the ocean, and the sea was the color of blood. The little girl made it through the door of the little cottage before she collapsed in a heap in the hallway, crying her eyes out. It was her grandmother who found her like that. Now, the girl's grandmother was very old and very wise. Mother used to tell her that grandmother had lived so long that she knew all the world's secrets.
When she was little, the girl had been frightened of her grandmother. But now, the old lady took the young woman in her arms, and she comforted her. Told the girl her mother was working late, and she wouldn't be home for a while. Told the girl she could tell her anything she wanted. And in the hallway of their little cottage, the girl did. She told her grandmother about the boy, and the barn, and all the terrible things those bigger boys had done to her in the shadows. And her grandmother listened, and she grew very silent and very still. Come with me, she said. The girl had hardly ever been in her grandmother's room before. When she was little, it always gave her the creeps. Her grandmother had lots of old, scary paintings on the walls, and strange little statues and carvings on her shelves. But right then, as her grandmother led her to an old wooden chair and sat her down, the girl hardly even noticed them. Her grandmother was speaking to her in a soothing voice, and all she could do was listen. She listened as her grandmother told her that there was a special trick she knew. A trick to protect against evil. A trick to protect her against those horrible boys. So that they'd never be able to hurt her again. So that she'd have control of them. As grandmother spoke, she fetched an old wooden box from the bottom of her wardrobe and unlocked it. Inside the box were countless knitted dolls. All of the dolls were the same blank cream color, with no facial features at all, save for the eyes. Every single doll had a pair of eyes that seemed to follow the girl. As grandmother pulled three dolls out of the box, she closed her own eyes, began to whisper. The sound made the girl's skin itch, but it didn't last long. Soon her grandmother had lined the dolls up on the carpet and her eyes were open again. The last thing she pulled from the box were a pair of black knitting needles and some yarn. Those boys that hurt you, sweetheart, she whispered. I want you to describe them to me. And although she was still terrified, and although it made her feel sick, the girl did. She described the boys as well as she could remember. She described them as her grandmother went to work with her needles. And finally... With the blood-red sun disappearing below the sea outside the cottage window, the dolls were finished. The girl's grandmother took the girl by the hands and looked into her eyes. I want you to keep hold of these dolls, sweetheart, she whispered. As long as you have possession of them, those boys will never be able to hurt you again. And do you know what? Those boys never did. The girl was sitting in an armchair overlooking the sea when her grandmother burst through the door of the cottage. It was two days after they'd made the dolls, and for the first time since she'd met the boy on the pathway, the girl was feeling calm again. As the girl turned from the window and smiled in greeting, the old woman held a newspaper out to the girl with shaking hands. Three brothers tortured and killed in brutal mass slaying, read the headline. Agatha, whispered her grandmother. Oh, Agatha, what did you do? But the girl just kept smiling. She kept smiling as she took her grandmother by the hand and led her upstairs to her bedroom. She kept smiling as she opened her little cupboard and pulled out a cardboard box. And when the old lady cried out in shock and horror as she saw the three dolls inside, the girl kept smiling still. What did you do, Agatha? whispered her grandmother again, but it was pretty obvious what the girl had done. Each of the dolls had been impaled with at least a dozen sewing pins, all of which had been pushed through their knitted heads. The area below each of their waists had been burned black with a flame. The girl smiled down at her work and took her grandmother's shaking hands in her own. They won't be hurting anyone now, will they? She whispered. You see, sweetheart, said Grandma, as she stood up from my bed and switched off the light. I gave you one with a happy ending. I lay in the dark, feeling sick. I don't think I'd understood everything Grandma had told me. Not right then, at least. But I'd understood enough. 
I'd understood enough to know I felt worse now than I had before the story started. Grandma, wait, I said, my voice stopping her mid-turn. Isn't your name Agatha? Grandma looked back at me and smiled. She walked over and leaned down, kissing me on my forehead. Time to get some sleep, Chris, she whispered. And remember, that present I got for you is always there, if you ever need it. She stood up and left my bedroom. I stared after her. But a few moments later, my eyes were pulled back to the gift on my bedside table. The knitted doll. It gazed right back at me, its face featureless, save for two blank, staring eyes. And now, a word from our sponsor, Feels. As I'm sure you're perfectly aware, life has got stress that just is naturally embedded in it. And getting older, you may learn how to deal with that stress a little bit better, but it's always nice to have a little bit of help, especially if you're not sleeping well or you've got chronic pain. Many of us do. Now, I've been suffering with acute sciatica in my right hip and leg for a, about six or seven years right now. And if you're like me and you research pain relieving methods, you come to find that CBD is the most excellent way to deal with stress, anxiety, chronic pain, trouble sleeping even because of those things. Feels naturally helps reduce things like stress, but in my case, pain and sleeplessness. What I've discovered about Feels, it reduces my pain, which allows me to sleep, and I wake up refreshed. So I don't start my morning like 400% stressed or have the anxiety about how am I gonna deal with this today? How am I gonna do that? No, no, no. So I place a couple of drops of Feels under my tongue, Within five minutes, five minutes, the pain starts to go away. Again, with Feels CBD, there's no high hangover or addiction, period. So I wanna invite you to join the Feels community and get Feels delivered to your door every month. This will just make your life better. Quality of life is everything. You're gonna save money on every order and you can pause or cancel at any time. There's no doubt about it, Feels has me feeling my best every day and it can help you too. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash chilling and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. That's F-E-A-L-S dot com slash chilling to become a member and get 50% automatically taken off your first order with free shipping. Feels.com slash chilling. Thank you for taking time to visit our sponsors. We and they greatly appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed The Witch, as written by Sam Hasem and voiced by Evil Idol 2020 contestant number 20, Kristen Martin. If you enjoyed that last tale, be sure to check out more of Mr. Hasem's work and get info on where you can pick up his latest releases at his official website, samhasem.com. That's Sam Hasem, spelled H-A-Y-S-O-M, dot com. Thanks for your support of tonight's featured authors. It means a lot to all of us. Up next, we've got a third and final dose of The Dreadful for you, written by author Heath Pfaff and performed by Evil Idol 2020 contestant number 19, Paul J. McSorley. In it, a gentleman suffering from a bevy of mental maladies offers to help his significant other with an errand. Little does he know that seemingly innocuous task is the catalyst for something far more frightening than a typical panic attack. Without further ado, I present to you, Cycling. The world came back into focus. She stood motionless at the edge of the bed, watching me from beneath the decaying black shroud that covered her head. Two white reflective orbs passed over me. I could feel the pressure of her dread gaze as it seemed to push me into the mattress. For all that it made a difference, she might have been sitting on my chest. I struggled to move, but my arms refused my commands. I fought to call out, but my voice was stifled by the pressure holding me to what should have been my place of respite. 
the horror of her presence was consuming. I called her the witch. I had met her enough times now that I was familiar with how this would play out. She would watch me standing quietly between the door of my bedroom and the foot of my bed, and nothing I tried to do would make her go away. The witch would not leave until she was ready to go, and then she would flow out the door as though she were smoke on a strong breeze, distorting and peeling away from reality in an instant. The pressure would leave my chest, and then I would break free of my sleep paralysis and try to put away the horror of what had just happened. That was how this worked. Knowing what was happening, understanding what I was feeling, that should have made it easier to cope with this terrible fabrication of my mind. But it never did. Being told by professionals that this wasn't real and it was nothing to fear did nothing to alleviate the sensation of being in that moment. Logically, some part of my mind knew that I was safe. The witch wasn't real. She couldn't hurt me. Logic, however, had no place in this hell between dreams and waking. My heart was racing beneath my ribs. Wake up! Wake up! Please, just wake up! I could hear the words as though I was speaking them aloud, but I could tell my mouth wasn't moving. No part of me could move. Then when my horror felt that it could grow no further, the witch moved towards the bed. This had never happened before. I had seen her hundreds of times, and hundreds of times she had entered through the door, stopped, and stood in place until she vanished in a street. Never, not even once, had she taken another step forward after stopping. I felt my breath catch in my lungs, and then she took another step forward. A hand rose at her side, arm draped in the same decrepit dark fabric that covered the rest of her, but this was the first time I'd ever seen a piece of this entity's body. The skin was gray-green and brittle-looking, as though it might crumble away if touched. Her fingers were long and gnarled, a claw more than a human hand, and as I watched the digits bent in unsettling ways, the main knuckles of the fingers flexing backwards as though they hinged in either direction. It stepped forward again, and for a brief moment I managed a clear view of those two glowing orbs hidden beneath the draped hood. They were perfectly round, bulging forward, but set too far apart for a human face. The part of my brain that knew what a human should look like immediately rejected even the vague positioning of the eyes that I was seeing, recoiling at the inhumanity of the hidden visage. I suddenly had a disturbing feeling that this thing, this horrible nightmare, was about to speak. I wasn't sure why I thought this to be the case, what intuition might have brought my frantically scrambling mind to that conclusion, but I knew that it was about to utter some string of words, and I knew equally well that hearing them would work to unravel my mind. The last hold I had on reality would fray, and parts of my reason would scatter into the abyss. Bring it to us. It spoke a single, short sentence in a voice that hissed and churned like bone dragged across brick until it splintered. The words cut into my mind, and for a moment I had an image of some gargantuan nightmare floating in a sea of darkness, a tall man standing before it with bottomless eyes peering at me through the void. I found my scream. The bed rushed up to hit me in the back and I let out a roar of terror that filled the space around me before I sat up straight in bed, one hand knotted in the sheets at my side and the other grasping something heavy and solid. My eyes devoured the area at the foot of the bed reaching across the space before me and demanding reason to be restored. It was. The room was empty. The place before me was empty, and the doorway to the hall was open, a faint glow of daylight tracing in from the window at its end. I looked down at my hands and discovered that I was clutching the revolver I kept locked in the gun safe next to the bed. In shock, I reached down next to the bed and pulled the safe up onto the mattress. I put the gun away quickly and locked the box. I didn't remember having taken it. I'd never done anything like that before. Nate, are you all right? The concerned voice coming down the hall was followed a moment later by my wife rushing her way into the room. I could see the worry evident on her face, but as she took in my current state, her features softened some. Sleep paralysis? She asked, making her way to the bed before sitting on its edge and reaching out to rub my shoulder. Her eyes caught the lockbox sitting on the bed next to me. Of all the pieces of my life, 
Kayla was the best by far. She was solid when everything else was chaos, and she put up with all my many, many faults. Just seeing her normally helped chase away the nightmare, but today it didn't want to let go. I forced a smile and nodded. The witch was around for a visit again. I woke up startled and grabbed the box. Luckily, I didn't get it open. I tried to make things seem less dire than it had felt, and I didn't want her to know how close I had come to disaster. The truth was that I was tired and afraid. For some reason, that morning, I felt worse than I could remember feeling in a long time. Desperation and fatigue clung to me. Perhaps we should change the code to something I don't know. Kayla stroked my back and nodded. We don't want you hurting yourself. She looked sadly at the pills piled up on my nightstand. The new medication isn't working then? I shrugged. The nightmares are less intense, but the sleep paralysis hasn't changed. The doctor did say we might need to increase the dosage. I pointed out, not wanting for Kayla to give up hope on this route just yet. I held little real hope for myself, but I didn't want to see Kayla sad. I'd pretend if it made her feel better. I'd been on the new pills for a few weeks now, and they were supposed to be helping me. Maybe that morning's sleep paralysis attack had just been a side effect of the new medication kicking in? We'll give this some more time. I'm sure it'll help. I told her, swinging my legs to the edge of the bed so I could get up. I slid the lockbox back into the nightstand. Kayla sighed and gave my back one more rub before she stood up again. She was already dressed for work. She even had her mug in one hand. She must have heard me just before heading out to the garage. I gotta get going. The apology in her tone made me feel guilty for worrying her right before she had to go. I smiled harder, if such is a thing you can do, and nodded. Yeah, go ahead. I'll be fine. Just have to shake off the dream. I'll grab a shower and some tea, then I'll be back to myself. She knew me far too well to buy that, but I knew she had at least accept my effort. All right. Okay. If you want, you don't have to do that bike thing today. It can wait. The bike thing. I had entirely forgotten about that. It had been bothering me for a while now, but I knew that I needed to get it done. Kayla's lab was running a charity event, and I was supposed to go pick up a bike that was being offered as one of the prizes. Kayla would have done it herself, but the guy offering the bike wasn't available when she was. That meant she needed someone to help out. That meant I needed to help out. Along with my long list of other problems, I also suffered from agoraphobia and crippling social anxiety. The first was tied to the latter, but part of my progressing therapy involved trying to expose myself to situations I would normally avoid, even if it was uncomfortable to do so. So when Kayla had said she had needed to find someone to make this pickup, I had volunteered. I immediately regretted doing so, but Kayla had been so proud of me that I couldn't go back on my word. For once, I wanted to do something for her. I wanted her to be able to rely on me, and chances for that to happen seemed far fewer than she deserved. No, I'm going to do it, I told her firmly. You already set things up, so I'm going to go over there and pick up the bike. Saying the words made me feel a bit sick. She hesitated a moment before replying, a fleeting moment of concern touching her features again. Okay, but don't push yourself. We can always call him and let him know that you can't make it today. Let me know soon if you're not going. He's expecting you for ten. She spoke softly to me before she leaned in to kiss the corner of my mouth. With that, she was on her way to work and I was alone to try and figure out my day. I looked at the time. I needed to get moving. It felt like I was around and ready to head out the door with impossible efficiency. That was the way it always felt when I was getting ready to do something that I was dreading. I took a few deep breaths as I set the GPS on my phone to take me where I needed to go. The bike had been built by a man in a town an hour away from where we lived. I was hoping the drive, at least, would be somewhat relaxing. I took a dose of lorazepam and prepared to go. I made my way into the garage, pulling the house door shut behind me and dousing myself in the darkness of the carport. The automatic light had been out for a few months. It was one of those annoying problems that you never really thought about until you were on your way out and then you told yourself you'd get it when you came back. 
but you never quite remembered. I reached into my pocket and hit the unlock button on my key, causing the car to chirp and light the room. The headlights flashed, blinking once before coming on. For just a moment, as the room was bathed in the harsh white light of the LED headlamps on that first flash, I thought I caught a glimpse of two glowing orbs staring in my direction from the other side of the garage. My entire body tensed, but when the lights came back on, there was nothing remaining but the empty place where the wife's car would normally be. I forced myself to laugh. It sounded strange in the echoey garage, but the noise of it helped me to focus on the immediate moment again. My dream had shaken me. It wasn't surprising that it was sticking with me. I pushed down the fear and got in the car, opening the garage to let in the daylight. There seemed to be less monsters beneath the sun. The last thing I needed to deal with today was clinging nightmares, not when I had other, less ethereal fears to face. The road to Black Creek wound through the western New York hills as though it had fallen into place by chance and not by the design of any reasonable human agency. I had grown accustomed to driving on such meandering stretches of asphalt over the years. That these were mostly paved was a blessing. Soon enough, I found myself centering in on the location marked on my GPS. As I drew ever closer to my destination, the trepidation of what was to follow was growing inside of me. If I was lucky, I would arrive and someone would be waiting to greet me, perhaps a single person who had been keeping an eye open for me. They would be cordial and give me what I needed, and soon enough, I would be back on the road with my prize locked securely in the back of the car. If I was less lucky, then no one would be there to greet me, and I'd have to approach the house and knock on the door. I hated knocking on doors. It was difficult to voice why it bothered me so much. There was an uncomfortable element of the unknown. In my head, I was already playing out several different possibilities that might occur if I did have to go to the door, most of them ending with me doing something awkward or embarrassing. The GPS informed me that I had reached my destination as I pulled my car up to a dirt driveway that cut its way through a line of trees. There was an old mailbox post with the address number posted on it to one side, confirming that this was where I wanted to be. Though the post was falling over and the mailbox was a rusted crushed piece of metal that looked like it probably wasn't in use anymore. The driveway was little more than a pair of tracks cutting up through some overgrown grass. It took me about a hundred yards up to what should have been the house, but in place of the home I expected to find was a pile of scorched timber laying in a heap in the middle of the field of grass. I almost stopped the car and turned myself around, but ahead of me I saw a relatively new truck parked in a partially cleared off space near the burnt husk of the home. There was a man standing next to the truck and he waved as I approached. I pulled the car to a stop as Emily Brune sang the lines, so I ran into the forest black, hoping to find an answer in the woods, but this time, this time I must turn back. The only answer is I never could. I switched off the car, took a deep breath and got out. The man, Mark Felker, made his way over to me as I put my keys in my pocket. My eyes passed between him and the burnt out home in front of us. He was a short man at least a foot shorter than I was. He had wide, dark eyes and a smile that looked as nervous as I felt inside. He was dressed in jeans and a flannel shirt that looked as though it had seen some better days. Nathan? He held out his hand to me. I put on my best imitation of a confident smile and forced myself forward. I hated touching people, especially those I didn't know. It wasn't a matter of fearing they were dirty or anything so easy to explain. I simply didn't like getting physically close to those I didn't know very well. Even close friends I rarely ever came into contact with. Still, I took his hand and shook it firmly as I nodded. Mark? Though at this point it was merely a formality, he nodded. I found my eyes slipping back over to the house. The skeletal remains of the tragedy kept drawing my attention. Is this recent? I asked him, confused about why we were meeting here. Mark shook his head. No, not recent. This happened several years ago now, he said, waving a hand at it as though to dismiss the wreckage. Oh, I wasn't sure what to say. The bike is over here. Mark pulled my attention from where it lingered with a gesture in the opposite direction. 
I glanced where he was pointing and then jumped sharply. There was a barn there. It might seem strange to jump at the presence of a building, but there was more to it than that it was there and I hadn't noticed it until that moment. I had driven all the way up the driveway without seeing it and I had even gotten out of the car while looking in that direction. I could have sworn the barn wasn't there before. Up here to work on things in peace and quiet. I don't have the money to rebuild so there is only the barn now. Mark's voice drew me back into the moment. I nodded, not having really heard what he was talking about and still unsettled by the barn. It was old. I had seen these kinds of barns before, the old-fashioned style. If you pictured it painted red and white, you'd known exactly what it looked like. But this one was the color of heavily weathered wood, wood at the very end of its functional age. I wouldn't have dared go up into the loft in this thing. It looked as though it was ready to quit existing at any moment. I found a growing sense of unease taking hold. Today had been a strange day so far, and I was increasingly uncertain if I was ready to go any further. I was half tempted to get back in my car and leave at that moment, but that would just mean that Kayla would have to come here on her own to finish this. I was already here. The bike is inside the barn, Mark explained, starting off in that direction. Oh, do you mind if I stay here while you get it? I felt an intense desire to avoid the barn, to avoid going any further onto this property at all. Mark hesitated before turning back to me. Oh, well, there are actually a few different bikes. Thought you might like to have a look at them and see what you'd prefer. He laughed a bit. Maybe even take a couple off my hands. I chewed on my lower lip nervously. I wanted to tell him just to bring the one in the picture, but I also didn't want to start a confrontation here with him. I didn't do well with confrontation. I did my best to hide my discomfort before nodding. All right, let's see what you have. Having an extra bike could only help Kayla, right? This would be for the better. Good, he barked a short laugh and started leading us up a rough and overgrown path towards the barn. There were a few uneven flagstones marking the path on the way but it was clear no one had bothered to keep them up in a few years. Back when my wife and girls were still here, I used to keep this all tidy, but there isn't any reason to do so anymore. They don't come up here anymore? The words tumbled out over my lips before I really thought them through. Just a few hundred feet from the burnt-out remains of the man's house, I knew I had made a mistake. Mark stopped for a moment, his eyes fixed ahead of him. Finally, he shook his head. No, they're with him now. They were in the house when it burned down. I'm... I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to... I felt terrible. I couldn't think of any words that might help, but thankfully, Mark cut off my attempt to fumble for something that was even half as sincere as it needed to be. He turned and looked at me. His dark eyes looked sad, but there was a cold distance behind them as well. It's all right, Nathan. I have faith I will see them again. Destiny wouldn't be so cruel as to keep me from them. I was happy he turned back around and began walking again before I had to reply. I didn't know what to say. I supposed I was happy he found comfort in his faith. Have you been building bikes for a long time? I asked, trying to get back on a more comfortable ground. We were getting closer to the barn. It loomed over us like the hollowed corpse of an ancient dead titan. I had the impression that its doors were like a mouth and as Mark unbarred them, he was actually removing their muzzle. Building? He seemed confused, but then nodded. Yes, for a while now. Go ahead in while I latch down these doors so they don't swing in the wind. I took a step forward and stopped. The inside of the barn was dark. The light coming in through the open door barely seemed to penetrate the depth of the black within. I took another couple steps forward, squinting to try and see the bikes. It's dark. Yes, it is. Mark's voice came from behind me. A moment later, the world crashed into blackness as the doors at my back swung shut. I was confused. The doors had blown close. That was my first rational thought. It hadn't been that windy, but Mark had said he needed to fasten them. I waited quietly for a few moments, expecting them to open again, but they didn't. The only light that existed came in from the seam beneath and the one where the two large doors met. Somehow the rest of the building, despite its old decayed state, 
seemed to hold out all of the sun. Mark? I called out, my voice too small, as though I was calling into an area that was barely big enough to fit my body and the air directly around me. I'm sorry, Nathan. His voice called from the other side. He said it had to be you. Destiny is inescapable. It brought my family here, and now it has brought you. I'm so sorry. Just, just do what it wants. You will in time anyway. His words sparked a panic in me. What do you mean? That answering voice, my voice, was strange to my ears, strained as it was by fear and confusion. The crack beneath the door, the thin sliver of light from the outside world, began to slip away. It dimmed as though the sun was passing behind an increasingly dense cloud. Mark! I shouted this time, coming forward and banging the side of a fist against the barn's entrance. It barely gave to my angry strike, and nothing of my rage seemed to slow the coming of the darkness. The hairs along the back of my neck prickled as though a spider had crawled its way across my skin, and I turned in place as quickly as I could, pushing my back against the wooden door and peering into the dark that had been at my back a moment before. Hello? My voice was so small, almost like a child's. Who was I even calling to? I was alone here, wasn't I? No. No. Even as the question passed over the surface of my mind, I knew the answer. Two orbs of white winked into existence, perfect circles of predatory malice. She was here, and for a moment I almost felt relief. If she was here, then I must be dreaming. I'd only ever seen her in that moment of paralyzed anguish between sleep and waking. This had to mean I was actually back in my bed, unable to get up, frozen in place and feeling helpless. Not real. The words I spoke shook that frail hope. The rough texture of the wooden door against my fingertips whispered, Lies, to my last lingering hope that this was still a dream. I could move, I could talk, and I could feel every shallow gasp of breath as my lungs filled with fetid old air. Reality as you see it is frail. A smooth, resonant voice peeled from the void. My eyes were drawn towards it, away from the glowing circular orbs that had so fixated me a moment before. Something was coming through the dark, moving towards me. Your kind build laws and reason upon an existence that is far more vast than you can perceive, Nathan. The man stepped from the shadows and into a light that seemed to almost rise up from the air about him, as though his presence so irritated it that it couldn't help but highlight his features. He was tall with an oddly noble bearing, dressed in a suit of black that seemed tailored perfectly to his frame. His face was almost plain, but for a small smile that stretched too far across his jaw and eyes that echoed the void at his back. There was nothing behind them. Looking into his eyes was like looking into absolute emptiness, and I found that I couldn't meet his gaze for more than a moment at a time. I don't understand what's happening, I managed to say, pushing myself against the door more firmly. It felt like a wall now, like there was no give to the large barn doors at all. I am building something, Nathan. Something vast and important. You will be a part of the mechanism, but first you must agree to take your place. We must enter an agreement. It smiled even more widely, exposing a mouth packed full of hundreds upon hundreds of needle-like teeth. Every fiber of my body was shaking as though fear had gripped me down to the cellular level. I don't want to be part of this. I just want to go home. Bring us her heart, Nathan. A voice hissed into my ear and I turned my head to the side to see the two glowing eyes of the witch just inches from my face. Her crooked hands reached forward and grabbed my head, twisting my attention forward again. The black-eyed man was closer. Nathan, bring us Kayla's heart and we will stop your suffering. Fulfill the contract. His hand reached forward and I could feel his cold fingers covering my face. I struggled to move, but I felt trapped in place. Everything was dark. Everything was still. It all began to fade. The image of the black-clothed man, the shadow of the ruinous barn, and the sad, empty eyes of its keeper began to bleed away from me. Then I could see once again. The world came back into focus. She stood motionless at the edge of the bed, watching me from beneath the decaying black shroud that covered her head. 
two white reflective orbs passed over me. I could feel the pressure of her dread gaze as it seemed to push me into the mattress. For all that it made a difference, she might have been sitting on my chest. I struggled to move, but my arms refused my commands. I fought to call out, but my voice was stifled by the pressure holding me to what should have been my place of respite. The horror of her presence was consuming. And now, a word from our sponsor, Hulu, and the brand new series, Hellstrom. Streaming now, just in time for Halloween. A mature, suspenseful, mysterious, scary, dark, thrilling, chilling, authentic, dark and dry humor, edgy, action-packed series. Marvel Television produced Hellstrom, which is based on characters from Marvel Comics. But this is a darker, more chilling, and supernatural side of the MCU. Hellstrom is essentially the story of a very complicated family. Every family has its demons, but not like the Hellstrom family. And the world isn't ready for a Hellstrom family reunion. It's all jump-started when a brother and sister with a complicated relationship have to come together to save their mother. Definitely not a typical superhero series. Hellstrom on Hulu leans more into the horror realm, which we hear at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights mind not at all. And season one consists of 10 one-hour episodes, which you can binge all at once. And something else you should know? This is not the story of kids discovering their powers. These are adults who have grown up apart and now have to learn how to deal with the emotional baggage they've accumulated throughout the years. Starring Tom Austin, Sidney Lemon, Elizabeth Marvel, Robert Wisdom, Ariana Guerra, June Carroll, and Elaine Uwe. The Hulu original series, Hellstrom. All episodes are streaming now, only on Hulu. Thanks for checking out our sponsors. We and they really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed Cycling, as written by Heath Pfaff and voiced by Evil Idol 2020 contestant number 19, Paul J. McSorley. If you enjoyed that tale, be sure to check out more of Mr. Pfaff's work and connect with him via his official website, fantasymeetshorror.com. That's fantasymeetshorror, all one word, dot com. Thanks again for your support of tonight's featured authors and of the indie horror community. Before we go, I'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Don't forget, all of tonight's performances featured contestants from this year's 2020 Evil Idol Horror Voice Acting Competition, which is being hosted on our official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel as we speak, and which will be running over the course of the next few months. If you enjoyed the performances tonight, visit our YouTube channel today and cast your vote on the entries for tonight's featured contestants and the other entries in the competition. Again, you can find Chilling Tales for Dark Nights in the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube on any search engine, or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation to see a current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. As always, we and the candidates appreciate your support. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. 
Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.